Welcome back to Work There for Woodworking. A few weeks ago, I published one of those build it, review it, and then do a project with it style videos on the new for 2017 x carp And specifically, I did it so we could compare and contrast the changes they've made to this X new model and what has stayed the same. In this video, I want to tune it up well beyond factory specs so hopefully I can gain a little bit more accuracy with it and make it a little bit more useful to my particular needs in my shop. To test out the changes, we're going to make some jewelry this time. And we're going to use some pony beads. But I'm going to use those pony beads in a little bit different way than I think you're expecting. So, come along and let's tune up this X-Carve. Now the first thing I want to tackle is the easiest, the flatness issue. Now this project right now from the factory is flat enough to get most work that people are going to be doing just fine. Sign making, all that kind of stuff, just great. But if you're actually cutting all the way through a product, making sure that the distance between the bottom of your bit and your waste board is equal all the way across will allow you to cut through it and just slightly touch your waste board to make sure you get through the entire project. Now, in the first project I did on this x carp and a very common issue I had with my last one, and one that's been talked about quite a bit, is that when you go through the cut, you leave the little tab so your center pieces stay in the center, but it doesn't always go all the way through. Or it might go through in one spot and not the other. And that's a problem I had in my first test project. That was because the distance is, you know, we're talking thousands of an inch different all the way around. So, in order to get it flat, we have to take into account three different things. Number one, the flatness of your table. If you're not starting out with a very flat surface, you're not going to end up with a flat surface because everything else is going to kind of bend towards that. It's going to settle and you're going to have to deal with that. Now, right here, I've got a little table I built for the first x carb, And I've said in the past that I'm going to build a dedicated works table station storage solution for this x carb which means all this flatness technique I'm doing right now, I'm going to have to redo when I move the x carb because it's going to affect the flatness. The table it's sitting on is your number one concern. The second step is going to be this MDF base. Now the MDF is a very good substrate for this kind of project. It's very uniform the way they manufacture it. It's basically sawdust and glue compressed together with a little film slack on top. The thing is, it is sawdust and glue, so it's going to absorb and extract moisture from the air, so there is a chance of a little bit of movement. An example being right here. My waste board is anchored down to the frame rails, just as the factory tells you. Three screws in front, two screws on either, one screw on either side, and three in back. Which means that these corners, all right here, are not anchored down, which you can see every single one of mine has a little bit of flex. What that means is if I ever anchor something down, even using these screw anchors, it's going to be kicked up a little bit on the sides. So that's a variable that will affect how the bit distance is to the work surface. So we want to take care of that. The final bit of this is going to utilize a flat surface here the waste board that is anchored down to it and keeps the frame itself down on it and then flattens this to that frame, then we can use these two bottom screws on each one of the corners to do some minor adjustments. Now I've loosened these to show you that there is about an eighth of an inch of play in there. So there's got to be a systematic way we can take advantage of that to increase the flatness of our entire machine. Now my tabletop is as flat as I can make it. So my first step, I'm going to focus on the MDF substrate, the waste board, and get it anchored down to that tabletop so that they will form a nice flat parallel surface. Now the first step is laying out where you're going to drill the holes to anchor that waste board down to the table. Here I'm going as far into the corner as I feel comfortable because I have to take into account that there are aluminum frame rails and there's a triangle piece that connects those two aluminum frame rails. I also marked out a second point in between the first and the factory screw that's in the middle of the side piece. Now I'm using a flathead screw for this application because it'll add a little bit more torque, but I want to recess it. 
Notice my trick for using a Forstner bit and a little Sharpie mark to determine my depth. Very simple, very easy to do. Now, do you have to recess the head screw heads? Not necessarily. This isn't in a part of the waste board that the uh, CNC is going to reach. But if you tend to do signs that extend underneath the side rails, you do want them flush so that they won't be pivoting off that point. Just drill down a little bit. Then you can use the center point of that Forstner bit to center your hole. Please notice I had a little bit too much pressure here when I was pushing down and it burst through the backside a little bit. Doesn't take much pressure to drill through MDF, so a very light touch is well rewarded. The screws I'm using are threaded all the way to the top. There is no smooth shank, and that's something you need to take into consideration. You need to drill a hole big enough so that the screw threads will slide through or grab very, very little bit, and yet the head will still clamp down hard. If your screw threads bite into both the MDF and plywood, it will lock that raised gap in there. You need it to be able to slip in the MDF so it will cinch it down to the uh, table's plywood. Now this is your last chance of doing the alignment, and I suggest that when you screw them in, you screw in the opposite corners, that way it won't slip as much. But don't screw them all the way down, leave them a little bit loose. The reason is you've already taken away a lot of the MDF strength when you recess that screw head. It's down to about two thirds its original thickness. So you don't want to blow it out because there is an air gap underneath it. So use a hand screw to do the last little bit of tightening. When you get rid of that vibration, that clank, you know that the MDF is pushing the aluminum against a table and there's no gap anywhere. So that's as parallel as you're gonna be able to get it. So next up, we need to start working on these uh, Y-axis rails uh, to get them level all the way across. And I haven't read anything about this, but just thinking it through, common sense, I think we can come up with a system to make it easier to level it anytime we move the x car. So the first thing I want to do is create a baseline. I want to loosen up all these bottom bolts and shove this as far, play, as far down as go, probably so it's uh, touching onto the table, and then tighten them all up. But before I do anything to these bolts down here, I'm going to move this next carriage all the way down. That is because these Y carriages are locked in between the rails. That's what we set up when we first did the setup according to the instructions from Inventables. Well, when I loosen these up, I don't want to risk moving these back and forth. So having this right here, just the wheels themselves will keep it somewhat aligned this way so all we are concerned with is working this way. So the idea is I've got the X carriage all the way forward to lock this in left and right. And I'm going to loosen these two screws that ride in those sliders so that this will move freely now. I can move it up and down as we can see. So I'm going to put it in its bottommost situation and retighten it and then do the same thing to all four corners. So I know that every corner is in its bottommost orientation. It can't go any lower. So now the idea is I want to find the highest corner on this X card and then raise the other corners up to that level because I can't go down any farther lower. I I'm going to use my little Z probe thing and some business cards for the simple reason they are a set height and set width. I'm just going to put this right here and I'm going to lower my bit down until it touches the business card. Now why is the business card there? Because what happens if this is the lowest one and all the other ones are higher, I don't want to damage my bit. So I've got everything turned off so all the motors are relaxed and I can use a little driver on the top of my x card to lower it down. Now let's slide it over to the other side and see if I can get the Z-probe and one business card underneath it. Okay, the Z-probe fit, oh, it looks like this one's gonna be a lot higher. I can just tell the gap, see there's no stitching whatsoever. And on that side, I had to work to pull it out. So 
So I know this side's a lot higher than the first side. Let's try the back. Okay, same test. Drop the Z-probe in. Oh, this is much higher than that side. So this is the highest corner so far. Let's check the other side. Okay, and it looks to me like these two are about equal. That one's a little bit lower. So that means that that corner over there, the only one where there was any stitching at all with this business card is the highest corner. And by that, I mean that the waste board over there is the highest one. So I need to lift that little uh, metal carriage up a little bit so it balances out. How much should I lift it up? Now my thinking is I can use these business cards as a feeler gauge. So let's see how many business cards I can fit under this side. Here's the one that I did on that side. So I've got quite a bit of gap. I'll try two more. Okay, one more. It looks like I can fit four business cards and get that kind of stiction I had on the first one right there. So four business cards, which means since I had one business card over there, I need to raise that side up three business cards thicknesses to get it level with this one over here. Let's try this side over there. Okay, this side right here, it's the same four business cards. Let's try that front over there. And this side, it looks like I can... I can't get a third business card in. So it's maybe two and a half business cards. So where we're at right now is I started out with one business card on top of that Z-probe on this corner. I got four business cards back on the back corners and a little bit more than two on this side. So my thinking is with the Z-probe forward, I am going to loosen this side up a little bit, enough so it slides. Count out three business cards, so I'll have a total of four. Remember, one was already under the Z-index. Lift this up, slide these three business cards in there, and then retighten it, and hopefully it will stay in that, that location just fine. And that should make it level with the back corner. So with that done, I've got that side set, and that side set, and I didn't adjust any either of these back sides because they were about the same, but I did readjust the spindle head so that only one card would fit through the new settings up front. And if everything worked out, yep, there's a little drag with one business card on this side. And this side's maybe a tad bit loose, but for my thinking, maybe that's an extra half business card. This is good enough for what I'm doing. Now, how long is that these settings going to stay? I don't know yet. I'm going to have to fiddle around with it. But at least I know how much I can add to just those sides and get it really close to accurate. Uh, so maybe I, I'll put some permanent shims underneath there for it to rest on so it won't go out of whack. Uh, we'll just have to test it and try it out for a little while. Now some of y'all smart cookies out there have seen one problem with my adjustments. I took care of the four corners, but I didn't take care of the center. And after I get all the four corners adjusted, I do notice that the center will not let me get the Z-probe in. So it's a tad bit higher than the four corners. I haven't figured out quite how I'm going to lower that portion. So this is the best I can do at the time. So let's move on to calibrating the stepper motors. Now the first thing I made with this new X car was remake an old project of mine, these hand mirrors. Because these mirrors showed me a issue I had with the old X car. And I want to see if it was still in the new X car, and sure enough it was. The thing was, when I drew a circle, a perfect five inch circle, what I found was a lot of times it might be 4.999 inches this way and maybe 4.7 inches this way. And the problem was that the stepper motors were calibrated to take a certain number of steps per millimeter to get to a total distance. 
and because we are using belts where there's a little bit of flex, a little bit of tension involved that we have to adjust, those calibrations are close but not accurate. So we need to recalibrate the stepper motors to take into account any kind of flex we have in the belt system that our X-Car uses. And this is not unique to the X-Car. Any system that uses some part that is under tension is going to have that aspect because there's a stretch factor to it. So, the nice thing is, Easel, that free software we get with uh, the Invenables and the X-Carve, makes it easy to do this adjustment. Now, adjusting stepper calibrations isn't something you're going to have to do too often. Maybe when you first set up the X-Carve and anytime you make adjustments on your belts, which from my experience on the first one isn't that often. It's not that big a deal. It's something that I did a few times on my first one, so I'm having to relearn adju this adjustment process each time. And there's a lot of forums, websites, even Inventables own forums that will help you out there. Uh, I found a fairly simple video that wasn't pre out there beforehand uh, from um, the Manhattan Wood Project, I believe. Something on uh, stepper motor adjustments, calibrations. I thought it was pretty good. So you might want to check that one out after this video. But uh, I'll try and simplify the explanation. So let's get busy. Now the problem I have is I deal with mainly imperial measurements. I'm a furniture maker and that's kind of standard in this industry. The Inventables, the X-Carve, even the layout they have right here and all the adjustments with the stepper motors, they're all done in metrics. So I have to work in metrics for making the adjustments. Now I don't have any metric measurements tools. This is the only one I have, but I did check something and if I line up the one here, if you go all the way out, it is still lined up perfectly with the lines here. So whoever did the printing of this ruler for the Inventables made it very accurate. More than accurate enough for me to do some adjustments. So I'm going to use this as my reference material to measure out the stepper motor's motion. So what we're actually going to be doing is updating the firmware of our X controller. The information that's stored there. This is not information that's stored in Easel. I like that one because if you're like me, I do all my designing on my better computer in my office where it's nice and AC'd, and I just have this laptop up at, out at the shop. So I can bring the files out here to run them, but I design them elsewhere. This is the information that it doesn't matter where you're doing the work. It's not part of the Easel program, but the Easel program does make it easy to find the information and change it on your X controller. So let me show you where that information is within Easel. So right here I've logged into Easel. I've started a new project. Doesn't really matter at this point what it is. So I'm going to come up to my machine up top, click that, and then on the setup, instead of going to set up your machine, I'm going to go down to advanced. Now don't worry, this is not that big a deal. Then come down to machine inspector right here. And right there you start getting down into the details and if you scroll down there's a box down here that has all the firmware settings within your X controller now if you don't have your software your computer plugged into the X controller it can't find these because they are on the X controller so these are coming directly from my machine and you know this looks complicated at first get-go but if you just scroll down and kind of read these things Z max travel in millimeters it all kind of makes sense. And the only thing you need to worry about is the label for the settings. And that's always a dollar sign and a number. It's kind of standardized. So if you just come down, scrolling down, you will find right here, dollar sign 102 equals 188.976. That is the Z index steps per millimeter. So it's making 188, 89 steps to travel one millimeter. We also have the X and Y coordinates. Now these are the only ones I'm going to be adjusting today. I'm not really too concerned about my Z index because it is a big number and I don't, it, it's not that big of concern for me. So real quickly we can see it's set to the standard 40 steps per millimeter. So just write that down and we'll come back to that later. Notice the X is 100 and the Y is 101. <laughs> Okay, here's a general idea of what we're going to be doing. I have my settings, uh, pound 100 for the x-axis, 101 for the y-axis, 102 for the z-axis. 
again, I'm not going to be worrying about this Z-axis for myself. The X and Y are currently set to 40 steps per millimeter. So the stepper motors are taking 40 little divots to go one millimeter. Now, I want to travel a certain distance. Let's say in my example, I did a five inch circle. And if you remember, it didn't go quite five inches. So that's why we're doing all these adjustments. So I have my desired distance. Doesn't matter what it is. If I plug that into my X carve and it only goes an actual distance of B, well, if I divide those two, it will give me a ratio. Now, if A and B are the exact same number, that ratio is going to be one. If B is less than A, it's gonna be a little bit more than one. If it's more than A, it'll be a little bit less than one. So if I multiply that times the current settings I have for my x-axis, which was 40 millimeters, it will give me a new number to plug in. And that might be 40 point something, something, something in order to compensate for what is happening with the vari variable, the difference between my desired distance and actual distance. It's kind of common sense once you think about it. So let's go get those measurements of desired and actual distances. Okay, to do this test, I've come over to my x carve I've turned the entire machine off, I've lowered this down to just a, a fraction over the line so that I could line up the flute on one of my bits to the 10 millimeter mark on the x-axis. I'm now going to turn my x carve back on. So now everything, all the spindle motors are locked in. That is set up right there. I am not going to turn the rotor on, uh, the router on, so that it will stay in the same spot so that flute will be lined up perfectly. I then come over to the easel and I opened up a new project that was one millimeter thick, 500 millimeters long, and 500 millimeters that way, just to be sure. And then I drew a line that was 488 millimeters long. Since I'm starting at the 10 here, it should end up at the 490 there, because 10 plus 480 is 490. And then I've set up to only go 0.1 millimeters deep, so at least it will move. And that should happen in one pass. Now, when I go to carve it, it's going to walk me through the settings. Confirm theory, material thickness, material secure. There is no material there. Confirm bit size doesn't really matter. I'm going to manually set my uh, Z index and I'm going to tell it it is already confirmed the holding position it's just slightly above there. Raise the bit. Make sure my I don't need a dust shoe. Confirm your spindle on. It's not going to be on. And then carve. And it is going to come down and slowly move across. Now, unfortunately, as it goes across, I don't know how to make it stop at this end. So what you have to do is kind of watch where that line, the flute stops. So as it gets close, just get prepared to kind of eyeball where that flute is going to stop. Make your mark. And then measure that out. Unfortunately, you're probably going to, have to do this a few times to get it dead on right, but I would just line up the ruler and then focus in and try and get eyeball where it stops and then take the average. So I'm looking probably maybe one and a half, two millimeters short of the full 480. So let's do the math. We wanted to go 480 millimeters. We actually did 478, I'm going to say 0.5 because it's somewhat in between. So 480 divided by 478.5 gives me 10031. 1.0031. I multiply that times my 40 millimeters per, uh, 40 steps per millimeter gives me a new 100 number equals times 40 equals 40.1254.
Now that's pretty close on the x-axis. It was just a tad bit off. But the x-axis was pretty close in my example. The y-axis is what was really off. What I suggest you do is do the x-axis, do the y-axis, and then go back and recheck. It might take you a few times to dial it in perfectly, but for me, I have a feeling that this first adjustment is going to get me close enough that I'm going to be happy. So let me show you how to add these numbers in so it will st save to your firmware. So back in Easel, let's go back up to the machine settings. Click on machine. Once again, go to advanced. Come down to the machine inspector. And you're back at this place with all the settings. You might have to hit the refresh to get your settings. So just come down and in the console, type in your x axis, which is dollar sign 100. Give it an equals. And then add in the number. Mine was 40. Point one two five four. Hit enter. So when you come down here in your settings, now it still says dollar sign one hundred equals forty. But if I come over and I hit refresh, it should change. You're gonna have to scroll down and look for your one hundred again. And there we go, dollar sign 100, the steps have changed to 40.125. So that one's all set. Now onto the Y axis and see where we're at. So we have the X and Y calibrated for distance, but I'm not quite sure they are square, meaning when it sends the X axis this way and it comes back Y axis, I don't think that that interaction is perfectly square. So I'm going to test that out. I'm going to repeat the line test where I drew a line all the way across here. I've lined the flute up with the grid that's printed on here. I'm going to send it across with the uh, easel. And I'm going to track that flute to see if it tracks from one side of this line to the other and see if there's any variation. So I've got it all set up. So let's go. Oh yeah, I can already tell. It's a full bit width over on this side. Quite a bit. Well, that ended up being more than a bit width off and I registered almost two millimeters over 46 inches down from that line. So this is definitely cocked this way. Let's see if it's off that way. I'm hoping it's the same amount going that way in the y-axis. Oh, we might be getting lucky. I think it's going to be roughly the same amount. Okay, I'm feeling kind of lucky right now. Yes, they are off from go tracking with the grid, but they were off the same amount. It was about two millimeters this side of the line on the x-axis and two millimeters on this side of the line on the y-axis. So in effect, I'm, I'm square, just slightly cocked. And there's no reason why I couldn't just leave this alone as is, because it will cut stuff out squarely. Uh, but I think I'll probably loosen these four screws up and try moving it over exactly two millimeters so that at least I'm tracking with the grid a little bit closer. So that's the last step I know of of calibrating my X-Carve. So let's start playing with some projects. So as I mentioned earlier, we're using plastic pony beads. You know those crafts beads that you can put, make costume jewelry out of, or if you're Bo Derek running down a beach, you'll braid into your hair. But the reason why I'm using them is because they're a lot easier to use than the rocks and stones and metal and stuff I use. In fact, 
You can just grind them up in the coffee grinder and they work just fine. If you want different variations of thickness of bead material or something like that, use some of those scientific sifters, you know, they use in the labs. Just drop the mixed up mixture on top and pretend they're a marumba. Just shake away. What you'll end up with is crushed up beads up top and then finer and finer grits of bead stones. And what's nice about this stuff is you can cut it, you can sand it, and you can polish it, and it is just dirt cheap. Okay, the idea for this jewelry is I'm going to be making some Halloween pendants. So to start it off, I opened up Illustrator, and I went out on the line, and I found a bunch of fair use artwork that I could use. Uh, such as this little ghost right here and what I'm going to do is using Illustrator I'm going to convert it from a JPEG or the GIF or whatever file it was using the live trace function I'm going to make the trace and expand it out so it separates it out into the, its individual parts ungroup it by uh, ungroup it I'm just using the keyboard shortcuts so now I can get rid of this white and it leaves just the black left over I'm then going to resize it to about the size that the pendant's going to be, which is a little bit more than two inches. So I'm bringing these down to right at two inches, or close enough. And I'll be doing a bunch of these so I can import one file into Easel. And how I'm going to do that is I'll come up, when I get them all, I'll go File, Save As, and when I save it, I will just save it as a SVG file which is importable into Easel. So let's do that now. So I've logged into Easel. I'm going to open up a new project. And if you understand Easel, all this area outside whatever you're working on is just scratch space. So I'm going to import an SVG file. And that contains all my artwork that I'm going to be dealing with. And I can just move those to the side of my waste board and it'll be just fine. The project I'm going to be doing, let's convert this into inches because I am backwards, I know that way. The project I'm going to be doing is from some scrap wood on a clock build that I kind of abandoned because I was having problems with the design that I came up with. And notice this on the Z index, how high it is. I'm going to put a fraction in there. It's 5 16 thick and it will give me the inches in decimals. Pretty cool. So that's the piece I'm going to be using. And so I'm going to move all my artwork to the side of that piece so it's out of the way. I do wish Easel would give us the spacebar hand function to move this stuff around. I mean, it's kind of standard in the industry. So all these pieces are now outside my work area. So I'm going to come over and make a shape. Now this shape, I want to be two and a half inches by two and a half inches now give each one of my artwork pieces oh that didn't look right 2.5 oh yeah you gotta click that each one of my art pieces are going to be that big so these will fit inside it and I should be able to do two across on the easel so the final stage before carving is to setting all my depths. You will notice I've got all my artwork set to not that deep, just a little bit over a sixteenth of an inch deep. All my scratch stuff is set to zero, so it's not going to be carving anything in my scratch area or outside the surface. And what you can see is I've got circles everywhere right now. They all cover around here. All those are set. Whoops. All the circles are set to zero. So I'm not going to cu cut the circles at this time. On these, you'll notice I have a two bits right here. I'm going to rough them out with a 1 16th inch bit. And then I'm going to go back with a 32nd inch bit to get the fine details. At which time, I'm going to start all over. I will reset all this artwork to zero. And I will bring the circles forward to cut all the way through and because they are not perfectly lined up I'm not worried about getting slightly off 
of my uh, zero zero axis right there. If I am, it's no big deal. But that way, I'll cut the I'll cut them out after doing the detail thing. It'll also give me a step in between to play around with the pony beads. So let's get to that next. Turned off the router, turned off the vacuum, removing my dust collector, grabbing my shield, raised it up a little bit. And now it's time to swap out bits without moving it at all. Walk through the Z index setting process again with the new setup. So the second stage of coloring is done, so let's set that aside, move this out of the way, see how we did. I'm pretty happy with these. That one right there, I'll probably have to make it a little bit bigger. It didn't work out. So let's grab some pony beads and see what we can do with it. So we crushed up these pony beads. I got some black ones, some white ones, and some orange ones. And these are the biggest chunks I had on them. So I'm going to start with them. And I'm just going to lay them into this recess of each one of those uh, pendants. Uh, just randomized colors, no particular order, just kind of roll them in there. Get it somewhat filled up as best I can with these big chunks. And then we will go down to the smaller size chunks. And then drizzle a little bit of super glue on them. Just get as much as I can in there so it takes up as much gap as possible. Don't be too frank frugal with this stuff. I mean, it, it is cheap pony beads that you just crushed up. No big deal. Uh, I think Halloween's kind of an orangey place, so I'm doing mainly orange in them. And I'm going to try and keep them separate so much. I have found, though, if you stick with one color, though, it kind of gets homogenous, and we don't want that. We want some pizzazz with these things. So I'm going to mix in some other colors of finer grit in here to fill in all the gaps. Now once I have all the big pieces in, I'm going to drizzle some thin super glue all over them. So kind of lock them all together, but don't overfill it. You just want to lock these, these in so that they don't come out. And we're going to come back in a second and put in some nicer, finer stuff to fill in all the gaps. All these are is to just kind of lock it together. Now the key thing you want to work for is when you're doing these bigger colors, try not to mix up the different shades. Now that you got the main colors in, it's time to mix them up. And since this is Halloween theme, I'm going to be drizzling in a lot of this very fine, the finest dust of those pony beads I have into the off colors. And I'll probably put black into the orange ones to fill in the gap on those. The thing you want to do is just make sure it gets into all those little crevices. 
And don't worry if you use a lot of it. This stuff is cheap. Now while this is setting up, you can take this time to go ahead and swap out your bit. Uh, go ahead and reprogram that file so that you're taking the exterior circle and not the drawing and get everything set up so you can have at it. I would give it a good 10 minutes to make sure that the super glue is somewhat dry and while you are carving it should dry the rest of the way. Looks pretty good so far doesn't it? So I installed a 1 8 inch straight flute bit and I changed the bit setting in the software. I've recessed all the artwork to make it white so that it's not going to cut those and I made the outlined circles dead black and it does have tabs so that they won't pop out. So now we just got to walk through the carve wizard and those little pendants will pop right out and we'll see how they look. So I just turned off the router, my X controller, computer, everything like that. Let me tell you, the advantage of sticking a 1 8 inch bit instead of just staying with those smaller ones is cutting out all these circles. If that was five minutes, I would be surprised. I mean, it just goes right through it. There's just so much more strength and durability. And the 1 8 inch bits are a lot cheaper than those really tiny ones. So let that do all the monster work and then use the fine work for just the details. So. Let's back it up and take it off. And here's kind of the key thing. How do we do with our setup? Remember leveling everything out? If we did it just right and got everything perfect, well then, it should have gone through, cut these circles out and not marred the base. So let's see how we did. The base isn't marked up. And, hey, a lot better than what we did. And remember that center section was kind of high, so, hey, this is great results. And if you were wanted to, you could just sand these off, put a little finish on it, and you would have some pendants. That's not my way. Let's see if we can take it to the next level. Well, there you go. We made some Halloween pendants. 
Pretty cool. I think the best out of this batch was this little cat one. Can we focus in on it? Uh, maybe you'll focus in. There we go. I think that one turned out pretty cool. I did learn a few things. Uh, I'll probably start out with the medium grip beads from now on, just because I think the big ones are a little bit too big uh, for this smaller application. And I did learn you can't use a friction polish on these to shine them up because it will melt the beads. Not so good. So I just got a little oil and wax on these right now. Uh, I can do the same exact thing for other holidays or even Christmas tree ornaments. And right now, I've got my machine paused. I really like that function. You can pause it right in the middle of a project and then start it right back up. Because uh, I've started another batch. And now that I've got this set up, I'm confident I can come in in the morning. I can start a few things, get them going, and then go do my other work and check up on it every now and then. Maybe do a set, uh, a, set a module or something like that. And now that's pretty dialed in, and when I say dialed in, I did take a caliper to these before I put them on the lathe. I just lost that footage, and they were right on the money. I was really happy about that, which means I can start using this to make uh, jigs for my other projects so I can start mass producing some of my other work, which I'm really excited about. That's going to, yeah, that's going to be good. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Maybe you learned a few things. If you did, consider liking, favoriting, subscribing, doing all those other social medias. Visit our website, wortheffort.com. I have a lot of swag there, including t-shirts and hats and stuff like that. I also sell a lot of my own work, bowls, containers, cabinets, that kind of stuff, along with tools and everything else. All of those help subsidize making videos like this. And I want you to remember one last thing after everything's said and done. It is always worth the effort to learn, create, and share with others. Y'all be safe and have fun.